My name is Juwan and I'm, um, today we are watching on the Russian Civil War part 1 1918 to 1919. Let's watch. The Bolsheviks have conquered Russia. Everywhere from Vladivostok to St. Petersburg, from Arkhangelsk to the Caucasus, are red. This was not accomplished through war or elections, but by revolution. There were those who resisted, nationalists along the periphery, and the Germans with whom Russia was still at war. But in the eyes of the Bolsheviks, the greatest threat were the Cossacks of the Don, who raised an army of 40,000 men to oppose them. The counter- I would think the greatest threat was the white army, or maybe, or maybe um, a bit early. Let's see. Revolution has revealed itself, and the Bolsheviks are ready for it. Late in November of 1917, the Red Guard were dispatched to deal with the threat. By the end of January, the Cossacks were scattered. Of course they were. How could any force possibly stand against the world communist revolution? Lenin announced to the Moscow Soviet, it can be said with certainty that in the main, the civil war has ended. So that was it. The civil war was over. The Bolsheviks were masters of Russia. But there um, surprise, surprise, the civil war did not end. Yet he, he had to go on for, for a bit longer. <laughs> it was just one problem. The civil war wasn't over yet. Huh. Not by a long shot. So you can call me Ezekiel. This is the Russian Civil War. Let's jump in. As the Cossacks of the Don fled the Red Guard, a few thousand Tsarists, led by General Kornilov, were forced to flee south into the Kuban steppe. This would be known to history as the Ice March. For 80 days, these men fought against cold, privation, and the Red Guard to secure a home base for their counter-revolution. This campaign nearly met a disastrous end at the siege of Ekaterinodar. The day before Kornilov was going to... Um, the general who was, was leading it got killed by, by shell, I think. I, I, I think it was a mortar shell that, that, that killed him. I'm, I'm not sure. Let's see. Launched the final assault, which would have probably failed. Artillery hit his headquarters yeah, and killed nice. him. The surviving generals gathered around their leader's corpse. One of them, General Alexeyev, turned to the man that would be Kornilov's successor and told him, you have inherited a heavy burden. May God help you. That man's name was Anton Denikin. With a little over 3,500 men, he had to liberate all of Russia. Denikin called off the siege and marched back to the Don. The situation there had changed since they'd left, and Denikin was going to take full advantage. Meanwhile, in Siberia, the 40,000 men of the Czechoslovak... So the Czechoslovak region, huh, their funny story. ...region were riding trains east of Vladivostok. They were once POWs, captured from Austria-Hungary during the war. So the thing is, um, most, most, most people from Czechoslovak region were actually, um, were actually nationalist. So, so when they got captured, and were actually, I'm basically offered the opportunity to, uh, to fight to liberate their lands. Most of them, I actually accept that. And they were going, going, going on with this until um, the Russian Civil War broke out. And, and the people who were they made to deal with them, the Russian Empire, no longer existed. So, they should not mind. But many Czechs and Slovaks were nationalists, more inclined to fight against their imperial masters than for them. The Russians knew this, and so gave these men a choice. They could either spend the rest of the war rotting in a Russian POW camp, or they could join the Russian army and fight to liberate their homeland. But now that the Bolsheviks were in charge, Russia was about to leave the war. So the Legion traveled to Vladivostok, hoping that the Allies could ship them to France. As it turned out, the Bolsheviks didn't like having 40,000 angry foreigners travel along their empire's key artery. They harassed the Legion at every opportunity. At the station of Chelyabinsk, they even arrested them. In response, the Legion seized the town and refused to give it back until their brothers were freed. When Soviet leadership heard about this incident, they panicked and ordered the Red Guard to disarm the Legion and force them into either the Bolshevik army or into work camps. This order was impossible. The Red Guard was barely an armed mob, and their leaders just ordered them to capture one of the most battle-hardened fighting forces on Earth. As soon as the Czechoslovak Legion got wind of what was happening, they rose up all along the Trans-Siberian Railroad and captured it in just a couple of days. They then handed it all over to the Russian White Movement. And, as <laughs> if the loss of Siberia to counter-revolutionaries... That probably prolonged the war a bit. ...wasn't bad enough, the Legion didn't leave Russia. Instead, the Allies landed over 100,000 troops in Siberia. Most of those troops, about 70,000, would be um, Japanese troops. Plus more in the northern port of Arkhangelsk, and ordered the Legion to turn west. The Legion made it all the way to Kazan, capturing both the city and the gold reserves inside of it. 
They also pushed north. What, have, what have happened to go, to go, to go reserves? Hmm, I don't know. North to Yekaterinburg, but that advance would have far less happy consequences. You see, Yekaterinburg was where the Bolsheviks were keeping the former royal family prisoner. Oh yeah, the local one, the, the, the local party secretary would actually kill the, the, the royal family. See, it, it wasn't order. The, the order didn't, didn't come from Lenin or, or whatnot. It actually came from the local, the local pe 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 people in charge who were afraid they would lose the city, so they got, got the word from the gun and had them executed. The party, Lenin and the party leader um, confirmed this move because, you know, frankly, why not? Up until now, the Bolsheviks were unsure about what to do with them. But with the Czechoslovak Legion approaching, a decision had to be made. At 2 a.m., the family was woken up and told that for their safety, they were being moved out of the city. The family and their servants, who volunteered to stay with them, got dressed. Nicholas then led the way while carrying Alexei, their hemophilic son, in his arms. Their captors crowded them into a basement. The family waited patiently until their lead captor made an announcement. Nicholas Alexandrovich, by order of the regional Soviet of the Urals, you are to be shot, along with all your family. Nicholas was horrified, asking, what? They shot Nicholas first, then his son, and finally his wife and daughters and servants. Shards of diamonds and precious jewels flew everywhere, as the women had concealed them in the linings of their dresses. Everyone was dead except for Anastasia, the youngest Romanov daughter. She cried out in fear, only having been slightly wounded. So one of the guards approached her and stabbed her twice with his bayonet. As the sun rose that morning, the bodies of the royal family were chopped up, burned, their bones dissolved in sulfuric acid, and the remains buried in a nearby mine shaft. The men who murdered the Romanovs were members of the Cheka, the predecessor to... And with members of the NKVD, then the KGB, and not FSB. A whole alphabet soup of similar organizations that would terrorize the Soviet Union for decades to come. But the Cheka was not the only change that the Bolsheviks would make to Russia. Ending the war with Germany was perhaps the only unique Bolshevik political program that was popular in Russia. So you see, thing is, most political parties in the Russian time were actually um, wanted, to, wanted to continue continue the war with Germany. But the Bolsheviks said, hey, no, we would end the war. So that's what made them really popular. So that's not, it's not like they're in charge, kind of. Okay, what do we do? Do we end the war? But they want, they, but Germans want, want, want them to give up like a lot of like like Lithuania or whatnot. But the the, the Bolsheviks don't want to give up their land. So Leon Trotsky comes up with an ingenious idea. They don't declare peace, but they don't, but they, 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 they don't they don't make peace with Germans with the Germans, but they, they don't keep fighting. They basically stop fighting and demobilize a large part of the army, but don't declare peace. Now, guess what happens? The Germans attack and make them sign an even more immediate peace treaty. Accomplishing it was vital to the party's future. In the first round of negotiations, the Germans demanded Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia. The Bolsheviks were outraged by this How and wanted you? better terms. So to gain leverage, they implemented a policy of neither peace nor war. The idea was that they would refuse to sign any treaty with the Germans, but demobilize their own army as though they had. That would surely bring better terms, right? Naturally, with no opposition, the Germans just marched deeper into Russia. This forced the Bolsheviks back into negotiations. This time, the Germans demanded all of the previous territories, plus an independent Ukraine, Finland, Baltic, and Transcaucasus. Most of the Bolsheviks again wanted to seek better terms, but Lenin figured out that they had no idea what they were doing, so stepped in to force the peace. With the Germans finally gone, demobilization could be completed, and their attention focused on the civil war. Events in Siberia had proved that the Red Guard wasn't working. Volunteer militias led... So yeah, what happened is here is, um, the thing is, the Red Guard wasn't working, right? So now the, the, the Communist Party, the Bolsheviks, had, had, had a problem. They, they, they could mobilize a lot of men, but they didn't have experienced officers. But then someone realized, wait a second, we just, had, we, just, we just had a massive world war. Yeah, there are lots of officers around. But yes, most, most of the officers weren't communist enough. So, the Bolsheviks Bush, Bush, had to find a way to make sure these officers stayed loyal. They did this by creating them commissars who were who, 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 who maintaining the political loyalty of the soldiers and the officers and make sure they, they can't be, be, betray them. By elected officers may have been useful for winning political battles, but they were militarily impotent. What the Bolsheviks needed was a large conscripted army led by a professional officer corps. Since they held all of the major cities, conscription wasn't a problem. 
but where could they find experienced officers? While Russia just demobilized one of the largest armies on Earth, the country was full of experienced officers. Specifically, ex-Tsarist officers. So the Bolsheviks took two measures to ensure their former enemy's loyalty. First was the Commissar system. Contrary to the popular meme, the Commissars were actually a very productive addition to the Red Army. They were great for morale, and more often than not maintained productive relationships with the officers they oversaw. When moved between units, Soviet officers would frequently ask to have their commissars transferred with them. The other measure the Bolsheviks took was tracking each of the officers' familial relations. That way, they could be used as hostages if the officer considered defecting. Because of these reforms, the Red Army... I know, I, I know the way the Red Army kept... What was so large was that they would, they would actually um, kidnap family members of, of, your, of the normal soldiers. They would say, oh, you don't fight, we're, we're going to have to kill family members. But that didn't always work out because, you know, a lot of great I think it was like a million defections happened during the war. Those kind of defected. He exploded in size, reaching 3 million men by October of 1919. They were armed with weapons taken from Russia's well stocked armories and led by veteran officers, overseen by loyal, if somewhat corrupt, commissars. When the Red Army was sent out to retake Kazan, the Czechoslovaks couldn't resist them. The only people who could save Russia now were the Russians. Meanwhile, in the south, the Soviet occupation of the Don would prove to be short. The Soviet Union actually peace of the people there so badly that we were within an army to kick them out, but then they, that doesn't really matter. Or it lived. The Bolsheviks alienated the Cossacks so much that they raised another army of 40,000 troops. This time, they not only successfully held the Don, but even launched an offensive into traditionally Russian territory. It was during this campaign that Stalin made a name for himself, defending the key city. Guess what Nazis going to name one day? Stalingrad. They're going to Nazi Stalingrad one day. Genius. Let's talk about for a little bit. See, what Stalin was, was actually actually in charge of the city. Is the defenses after this red, everything was terrible. But see, Stalin is not taking, you know, responsibility for all the terrible things that were happening in, in, the, in the city. So I said, hey, it's not my fault in that, that this, this city that I was going to cheese and that's not in charge of it. No, it's a military's fault. So it would it would run around the, run around the, the military leadership and kill them. That, 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 would, that, would, that would be one of the first steps to show his, his purges later on. Of Tsaritsyn. It would later be renamed to Stalingrad in his honor. When Denikin reached the Don, he grew his force to 9,000 men and launched a second Kuban campaign. This one proved to be much more successful than the Ice March, which is surprising since the Reds outnumbered the Whites by at least 8 to 1. Or at least it would be a surprise if you didn't know that his 9,000 men were, by far, the most elite force of the entire Russian Civil War. Over a third of them were experienced officers. In fact, this army was too elite. There were times when colonels had to perform the duties of privates. In any case, having achieved full control of the Kuban, Denikin's forces grew to 40,000 men. And, even better, he wasn't the only white commander with a rapidly growing army. Up until now, the Siberian government centered in Omsk was made up of squabbling anti-Bolshevik socialists. They were pretty much entirely propped up by the Czechoslovaks. Change was needed, and that change would come from, of all places, the Russian Navy. Alexander Kolchak, an admiral, along with the help of sympathetic Cossacks, pretty much walked into Omsk, arrested its socialist government, and declared himself the supreme ruler of all Russia. The Siberian whites loved this change. Officers who were unwilling to fight for socialists flooded into Kolchak's army. But the Czechoslovaks hated Kolchak. In fact, they were so disgusted by his coup that they left the front and joined the rest of the allies in only guarding the Siberian rear. But Kolchak didn't need them anymore. The Allies were sending all the weapons he'd need to raise his own army. At over 100,000 men, Kolchak's White Army was the largest force the Bolsheviks would face in the entire Civil War. It is. They would, they would, they would launch, launch an offensive that um, on paper seems super successful, but in reality, at least straight out that they are of the, the, the lines. Because now, it was it allowed the Bolsheviks to um, retreat back to their, their, their communication bases. And now, because they were not more communication bases now, right? They were closer to our supply lines and so they could fight for our weapons they wanted us easier while his forces were stretched thin having advanced so far away from their supply lines and yeah you know, you know get, get into the shit out of them on march 4th of 1918 that army attacked westward the reds responded by strategically retreating closer to their supply hubs 
So by April, Kolchak had advanced 250 miles. That may sound impressive, but it was a terrible mistake. The Whites were only seizing thinly populated and under-industrialized territory while doing little damage to the actual Red Army. They were also marching away from their own supply lines, which were being absolutely ravaged in the East. As it turned out, the Japanese, who provided over 70,000 of the Allied troops guarding Kolchak's rear, had an ulterior motive for being in Siberia. The Japanese were not in Siberia to fight communism or to get Russia back into the World War. They were only there to secure their own interests in the region. To that end, they armed and financed Cossack warlords who ravaged the Siberian East. Even though the Allies were committed to fully supplying the Siberian White Army, the Japanese wanted to go like uh, I think a bunch of buffer states, but I know they if it didn't work out because of the um, I think it wasn't with Japanese Navy that that is, that, that, that they didn't want it anymore. I wanted to retreat that and focus on um, the, the the Chinese. Can I'm not, I'm not really sure about those facts. But you but no, I suppose one Japanese I mean, army said they didn't want it want it anymore. That, 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 that and the, um, the Russians are, are going to power, 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 power by then. Most of that equipment never reached them. Whatever the brigands didn't steal disappeared into the pockets of corrupt officials. These were problems that Kolchak didn't know how to solve. The truth is that as an admiral, Kolchak had no experience with armies or politics. No one doubted Kolchak's commitment to the cause, but he just wasn't the right man for the job. When the Reds counterattacked, the Siberian White Army didn't stand a chance. Kolchak's forces began a long retreat from which they'd never recover. But Kolchak didn't even live to see the end of it. Be yeah, the, 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 the Czechoslovaks betrayed him and handed him over to the Reds who had him shot. But the thing is, Kolchak wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be the biggest threat to the Reds, no. The biggest threat would come from the, 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 the Caucasus, the Caucasus, 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 remember, I would come from the Caucasus. And, and those guys would almost be Moscow. I think what I what I kept she might outside Moscow for Moscow to follow what do I push back. In fact, the threat of, of this of this army which, which in Moscow was so great that that the members of the Bolshev of the Bolsheviks were actually printing fake passports in, in, in order for for, for, for them to escape to other other countries or other other, other cities just just in case Moscow got, got captured. Basically everyone was more more blessed for this. But, but lock, 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 lock for the Reds Luckily for the Reds, it never happened, and, and they won. Because, at the city of Irkutsk, he was captured by the Reds and shot. The Red Army had just proven itself far superior to the Red Guard that came before it. But that still might not be good enough, because Kolchak wasn't the greatest threat to the Bolsheviks in Russia. Because right as the Reds were turning the tide against Kolchak, Denikin made his move. But we'll be covering that in part two, which, when it's out, you'll be able to watch by clicking the link on the top right of your screen. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell. And if you'd like to help us make more videos like this one, so okay, yeah, that's it. And um, I hope I hope you um, like my reactions. Sorry about my stomach a little bit. I hope you like the, the, the reactions. Don't do it. If, you, if there's anything um, that you know that I don't know, please don't tell me. Yeah, like, share, subscribe, and have a good day, lovely people. Bye.